Thank you to the uh, SAGES committee for the privilege of the podium and this work. And this is a bit of a, an annual favorite of SAGES of what do we do in the, t in the setting that we have these multiple uh, redo fund applications. Uh, this is a disclosure slide. All of these are outside of the scope of the study. I have served as a consultant for a company called CME Info, and some of my co-authors have research and consulting relationships. Again, none of these are related to our study. So I want to start out by talking about a few numbers that are going to be very important uh, for this. And if anyone has been at the prior foregut sessions uh, in this conference, these numbers have been touted pretty broadly. 15.4%. Uh, this is the most recent estimate of the prevalence of gastroesophageal reflux disease in North America. Uh, Another interesting percentage is 40%. So the patients that don't get complete relief from their anti-secretory medication is pretty substantial. We would think that that would lead more people to go to surgery, but there's only about 1% of any of these patients that ever get referred to a surgeon uh, for any sort of surgical treatment or even to address that as an option. <laughs> Now, what are the typical treatments for gastroesophageal reflux disease? These are really a lot of these eponymous fund applications, including Nissen, uh, DOR, and Toupee. In our region, Nissen seems to be the most uh, prevalent, and that's the one that we specifically address with this study. So it's a 360-degree wrap. A couple of other percentages that come into play that are very important. 50% of those patients that have fund applications do end up back on or never come off of their anti-secretory medications. There's 20 to 30%, depending on which series and which definition you talk about, uh, that are defined as fund application failures, and that's what we're talking about here. And then of those, 3 to 6% eventually need a second, third, fourth, or maybe fifth operation to try to treat this disease. Now, fund application failure is a term that gets used often in the literature. Unfortunately, it suffers from a lack of any sort of universal definition. Uh, some studies use resumption of anti-secretory medications, though some patients never come off those. So that's a bit problematic. Others use symptom recurrence, but use a various uh, scoring systems to assess symptom recurrence. Uh, endoscopic evidence of esophagitis uh, or radiographic evidence of reflux on various uh, imaging studies, or some combination thereof. There's obviously reasons, we will readily admit that there are reasons for failure, and these can range from both technical aspects from the index operation and patient factors. A number of authors have tried to classify some of the anatomic ways that fund applications can fail. These are two different schema uh, from two different, one in the thoracic surgery literature and one in the general surgery literature. Uh, but there is one that's very important is this one, which is the wrap came completely undone. So this is essentially a restoration of normal anatomy by degradation often of the sutures. Uh, a herniation of part of the stomach through the wrap up back into the chest, the wrap itself into the chest. Uh, and then this one, which is another very important one to consider for the surgeons, is this was a wrap that was never placed in the correct place to begin with. So why do we look at Ru and Y as an option for an anti-reflux operation? So fund application primarily is addressing the valve mechanism at the distal esophagus and proximal stomach. Uh, but there were some earlier studies uh, going back to the 1990s that showed a 95% improvement in reflux after gastric bypass surgery. This was a bariatric surgery population, and this was something that was done retrospectively. Uh, but it gave us some evidence that this may be a very good operation uh, for patients that have severe refractory reflux, especially in the reoperative setting. This is really a volume-based thing. We remove not only the parietal cell volume from its continuity with the esophagus, but also the content that can even be exposed to the esophagus, where you're looking more on the order of 30 to 50 uh, cubic centimeters or milliliters of fluid uh, that can readily reflux back up the esophagus. There have been other studies that have shown that this sort of Ru and Y reconstruction have been superior to refund application in patients that have esophageal dysmotility, a short esophagus, have documented delays in gastric emptying, and have had more than one prior foregut operation. So we wanted to see specifically patients that have a complete wrap and this conversion to Ru and Y. So we looked back through a couple different sources, one a revisional database uh, that we keep of foregut and bariatric surgery at our institution and then searching through CPT codes. Our dates of inclusion were 2009 to 2017, and we wanted to specifically isolate the uh, minimally invasive approach. We defined that as any operation that was started in a minimally invasive manner. Patients under the age of 18 were excluded. Uh, some patients, we did not know the anatomy of their fund application prior to their operation, uh, so those patients were excluded, and if an open approach was initially planned, they were additionally excluded. We ended up with 50 patients over this 12-year period uh, with a median BMI of 36.7, and I will return to that BMI in a few slides. 
the female, uh, females predominated in this series, uh, and there was a mean age of about 53 years. In terms of prior fund applications, this was not a patient population that had just a single prior operation. Some of them had many as four prior uh, attempted fund applications, uh, and some others uh, that had a pyloroplasty as well. Uh, how do we go back? Thank you. Uh, it looks like there's a graphic out oh, there. The graphic does show up. So these are the reasons why we did this. And this is a bit misleading uh, because we did primarily, we, a couple of these or a significant portion of these patients had comorbid metabolic disease, which is really what steered us toward the RUNY reconstruction. But you can see that there is nearly two thirds of these patients uh, that have some other primary reason for their uh, revision and then why we pursued a RUNY anatomy, including some that had incorrect diagnoses at the beginning. We did attempt all 50 of these laparoscopically or, laparoscopically or robotically. We had one conversion for bleeding. Uh, the operative time was about 4.43 hours. So this is a, these are lengthy operations. Uh, and the estimated blood loss was about 130 cc's. One of the primary questions and one of the reasons we did this study was what do we do with the wrap? So there are some uh, practices that will take these wraps down completely when they're converting to a Ruin Y anatomy and others that leave it intact, electing not to disrupt that surgical plane uh, and instead make a pouch that's somewhat larger but below the wrap. So 72% in this series had the wrap taken down completely, meaning a restoration of normal anatomy. This is, again, a bit misleading because 16% of these patients actually had a subtotal gastrectomy in conjunction with their Ruin Y reconstruction. So what we end up with is a number of 12% that had a wrap left intact. Uh, largely, this is because these wraps were actually below the diaphragm uh, and or were extensively stuck, and we felt that it would be uh, an excessive risk to mobilize that wrap uh, and felt it a safer option for these patients to proceed with the laft wrapped intact. Notably, most of those patients did not suffer from significant dysphagia prior to these operations. And then in terms of length of reconstruction, what are we going to do with these limbs? So this is uh, this orange line is the BMI 35. That's the uh, point at which these uh, we consider these more of a metabolic operation, uh, at least either primarily or in combination with their anti-reflux. So you can see we're split roughly 50-50 in terms of patients that have some sort of metabolic component that is simultaneously being addressed with this reflux disease. But the majority of patients that don't have a metabolic disease that is comorbid are getting very short limbs, uh, often in the 75 to just under 100 centimeters. Uh, there was a significant, as is one of the perils of reoperative foregut surgery, significant reoperation rate. Uh, and then we had two patients each that had marginal ulcers, uh, super, superficial surgical site infections, a anastomotic leak, and this is one of those patients that this was their fourth or fifth foregut operation. Uh, and then one GI I believe, that did require transfusion a couple days after the operation. Obviously, there's some limitations to this. This is retrospective. There's a, clearly a selection bias here in terms of the way that we identified patients. Uh, and there is no specific CPT code for uh, redo uh, anti-reflex surgery in the setting of a prior fund application with Ruin Y reconstruction, that that would be a, a nice thing for billing purposes. Uh, and patient satisfaction uh, was not available for any of these operations, either before or after. So we conclude that this is technically difficult, but it's uh, uh, safe and feasible, even in the setting of multiple foregut operations, and we do recommend conventionally taking down the wrap if it's feasible.